Okay, welcome everybody. We, um, we appreciate you being here this afternoon for a, a little uh, public health uh, liaison update um, and question and answer series. Um, my name is Mike Grant. I'm with the Marin County Office of Education Rethinking Schools Task Force, and I'm joined uh, here today by a couple of my colleagues, Melina Boyd and Michelle Drake, along with uh, Dr. Santora and the public health team. And um, we appreciate you taking the time to be here uh, for this important discussion and update. And uh, I'm going to um, jump to, I think, the next slide. Yeah, so just a little review of today's agenda. Um, Dr. Santor and I uh, talked about it this morning and we've done a couple trainings uh, around the public health liaison position over the past few weeks. And we're really hoping that today is primarily just a discussion, a question and answer. We've got some experience under our belt. Um, and so uh, Dr. Santor is gonna take us through a little bit of an update on the transmission of COVID-19 in Marin County and and a, 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 a brief uh, um, introduction to her team at Public Health that are there to support schools. And I'm gonna give a little bit of a background and update of where we are right now with school operations in Marin County and where we've come through the spring and summer. And I'm gonna to touch a little bit on some of the highlights of the trainings that we did a couple of weeks ago around the role of the public health liaison. And, uh, and then we'll get into the Q&A. But, but most importantly, we wanna just say welcome uh, Marin County School Public Health Liaisons. You, uh, you, will, you are playing and will play a critical role in our ability to uh, support the health and safety of our students and staff and larger community in our um, efforts to return students to site-based classroom instruction as this ever-changing situation unfolds, um, continues to unfold. So thanks so much for being here. And um, with that, welcome. Hi, Lisa. Thanks again for being here, Dr. Santora. We're going to hand it over to you to give us an update. Thank you so much. And I just want to extend again my deep gratitude to all of you for being here and joining us on this journey. It is a journey and it promises to um, provide changes in course and direction. And it really is working together that's going to allow us to navigate successfully to create safer school environments and to keep kids in school, get kids back to school and keep them in school as long as possible. Um, some members of my team are here. Um, I see um, Marcia Grant, Linda Metz, uh, Sandra Rosenblum is a, uh, another public health nurse, nurse who's working with us. And then I see parts of our extended team. We have our Marin School Nurses Organization. Um, some members um, from that group, your school nurses are on this call as well. And it really, again, just, um, just demonstrates that it really is gonna take all of us together, um, learning from each other. We learned a lot that um, Mike's gonna share with you and we'll continue to learn more and just always um, ready to adapt and improve how we are both um, communicating and as well as um, ensuring that we have sufficient outreach and education to parents who are also gonna play such a critical role for us um, in creating these safer school environments. The good news is, is that we continue to stay at now at tier two, which is the red tier in the new blueprint for a safer economy. Um, we used to be, uh, as you may have heard before, we were red much closer to purple, and now we're getting um, solidly into the red um, numbers, um, which means we're having a lower case rate and lower testing positivity rate. Um, it's reassuring to me because we're also increasing testing now in some of the areas that have higher um, COVID-19 um, transmission and prevalence. And so even though our numbers are going down, we're seeing high, high numbers of testing in um, areas of concern across Marin County. We're also going to be working um, this week to expand. Um, we had an outbreak response in the canal area of San Rafael, and now we're shifting focus, which is um, a really important time for us um, towards outbreak prevention. So we'll be um, taking the lessons learned in San Rafael and applying them to Nevada, not um, to, to get ahead of the curve and more upstream and preventing and making sure we're having sufficient access to testing. Um, as well as outreach and education around wearing face covering and social distancing and engaging business and promoting um, safer business practices. Because um, it really is all of us working together, like I said, schools, businesses, families um, to reduce social activity, um, maintain those physical distances and wash hands, wash hands, wash hands all the time. Um, that's gonna keep us in the red and on our journey towards the orange um, tier, which is our next goal. Um, so if we stay in red, which I, 
we are anticipating we're going to stay in red. We are now aligning our data at the county level with the state on a daily basis to confirm where we're moving, um, which direction we're moving towards. Um, as soon as September 29th, all schools in Marin County would be able to open if they have a um, school site safety protection plan in place. Um, and there's agreement with um, labor and school staff to reopen. So um, right now, in this moment, we do have schools that are open and operating under waivers, um, successfully so, and we're really proud of the work that these schools did to prepare their waivers, which is the equivalent of your school site protection plan. Um, and so we are seeing great success there and looking forward to seeing and receiving the waivers from all the individual public schools in the county so we can review them um, and get them set to launch for reopening. Um, we definitely understand that um, September 29th is not a date that all schools are going to be opening in Marin County. Um, some schools are taking um, more time to, again, to, to plan and negotiate on how to return to school. And we stand here just as a resource to those administrations and um, school staff um, in that preparation work. Um, the takeaway from this is everyone, every school, everyone on this phone call should know seeing their school site a school site specific protection plan. That's something you should be familiar with. If you haven't um, seen that plan, reach out to your administrator or your principal to see that plan. This is the bedrock of our success. It with, builds confidence in staff and parents um, for the return of school. And it's um, investing the time upfront in planning um, always um, will provide us the protections that we need as we move forward into the school year. So I think we can jump ahead. Okay. So Lisa, you you uh, introduced your team who's there with you, and um, you know one of the one of the um, uh, you know aspects of being a public health liaison is you will be provided a specific phone number to this school support team that's not posted here. This is more the general number, but we we purposefully are not making up it a publicly posted number because we want it only for our public health liaisons and support administrators. Um, and that's by design. There's also a weekend number for, to the communicable disease desk as well. Yes. And, is there and anything is you, just, more, more you want to say on that, Lisa? Yeah, I know some of you may have been calling that main number, but again, we want to be as accessible um, to you as you're learning um, and you're going to be on a learning curve in the beginning. Um, so we'll, we'll have these effectively private that lines for you to call us and we'll be available 24 seven um, through the health officer on call as we again, sometimes we get lab reports or notice of staff test positive um, on the weekend. And we know um, sometimes it's much better to be responsive on the weekend and get um, ready for launching communications on Monday than waiting until Monday and then having gaps in communication. So we wanna demonstrate um, rapid access to us. Um, also to, sh to show you that we really believe the more we can be effective at communicating to the school community when there is um, a known COVID positive, um, appropriately so. We're not going to be sharing names or anything like that. We're going to have targeted communication, but um, clear communication channels is going to be critical for us um, staying open and, again, boosting the confidence in the community and keeping everyone on the same page. And then there was one other thought I had that was really important in my head that I forgot, but it'll come back to me. Well, well and, I, and I'll just add, Lisa, I also want to thank Linda and your whole team there for, uh, you know, acknowledging that this email address is, is monitored and responded to in a remarkably quick turnaround. So as good as the phone number, we've found the email to be super helpful. And, and, and like our rapid response email, we've got a team of people monitoring that and trying to be responsive. And, and your, your team has been great. Thank you. Yeah. They, they responded to me at nine o'clock okay. last night. So I, I, <laughs> I know. So, um, and, you know, so just a, a quick, you know, snapshot of where we are today with our schools. It's actually uh, pretty impressive there. So there's 33 schools that have been approved for TK waivers that, you know, were able 
are able to operate for TK through sixth grade um, without us being in tier two for two weeks. So they, they have been kind of up and running for the last couple weeks and some have been ramping up starting slow with a grade level at a time. We're starting, we're trying to gather data. There's 33 schools, 29 of them are private, independent and parochial schools. There are four public schools on that list. And we're, we're trying to gather some data about how many cohorts and how many students we probably have among those 33 schools about 130 cohorts over 1400 students they may not all be in session today but they will be by next week regardless of marine county's tier two status so that's a that's a starting place the marine county office of education our special education programs and alternative education programs have been operating since september 8th um, and we've got about 150 students in 37 different classes um, plus there are these student learning hubs which are really kind of proctored learning for distance learning for students who uh, who uh, need um, a space to do their distance learning and so we have about 35 of those hubs that are currently in session at 13 different sites they're primarily at schools um, some are at community centers and as of today there were 342 students who are currently active in those so you know, combined, there's, you know, well over 100 cohorts, over 1,800 students per day in session, which is a start. You know, I mean, I think we have 40,000 students in the county. So it's, it's, it's a step that's showing us how, how to do things in a safe and responsible way. Um, we have, you know, when you add it up, there's probably about 10,000 student days and over 500 cohort days since September 8th that, that have been started up. So that's good news. Um, and of course, you know, the, the experience that we have that helped build those systems and health and safety protocols with public health were through our, our uh, pop-up child care programs and our spring pilot programs and our summer programs that um, have the data here. Um, you know, this is the combined data from the pop-ups in the spring and summer where, you know, it's almost 6,500 student days and 94 days of operation. And we did in that time, uh, among 45 cohorts, we did have um, uh, one transmission uh, or, or uh, two siblings that um, had been exposed to a family member who drove them to their separate uh, um, pop-up child care programs. And um, we isolated those kids, tested them, they were asymptomatic and close those cohorts to get everyone tested and had a had you know the the results of that um experience were significant just in terms of working with public health and how communications had to happen i want to say that um part of the experience is that cohorts at the same sites didn't have to close part of the cohorting model is that when you do have an exposure which is expected when there's active COVID-19 um, that it, it, it can impact a smaller cohort so I don't know if there's anything more you want to say to that Lisa just to reinforce that um, the cohorting and um, the closure of cohortings are a tool a true tool um, it's a bit of a, a public health hammer in the sense that the majority of those kids that were in those cohorts did never develop COVID-19. Um, we only had one student to student transmission in a preschool age, whereas you can imagine social distancing um, is a lot harder. And that that's our, that is how we are being conservative to move forward um, with reopening. So as, and this will evolve um, as, as both COVID will evolve and our understanding of COVID, but in the beginning, we're going to be working with um, one one known positive of a teacher or a, a student will result in a closure of the entire cohort, regardless if there was close contact or not. And again, that's just to be have a as a conservative approach towards um, preventing any um, transmission of COVID-19 in our community. And that's the other thing I I, I saw. I I was away for a couple of days and I saw um, an exposure uh, a positive case uh, make the news. And I, it always has to, it reminds me, I have to um, balance my perspective because in my role and um, our nurses roles, what, what we see and hear every day is COVID-19 positive cases. And we know that for some staff um, in schools, it'll be, it may feel surprising when someone reports that they're COVID positive, but that is 
absolutely what we are expecting. We're expecting um, staff to report that they've had an exposure. Um, we're also expecting most of those exposures um, will be placed on quarantine and hopefully not um, convert to a positive COVID case. We're going to be expecting kids presenting with symptoms consistent with COVID and then be sent um, sent home um, for testing or not allowed into school until they get testing. Um, and the majority of those are not going to test positive for COVID, but there will be COVID positive cases. So just want to help everyone frame this. That this is not a zero um, zero risk um, environment. That's not what we're living in. What we're um, striving to achieve is, again, educating everyone to make sure we reduce the risk of COVID from entering into our school communities and being as rapid and proactive and conservative in our public health measures to prevent any COVID-19 transmission. Um, it's going to shift, it's shifting a burden um, and we really appreciate that. It's um, a new workload for staff, um, new work workload for teachers and for parents. And um, we know that parents um, have already been challenged in before COVID of sending kids sick to school. And we really are taking the responsibility seriously in public health that of our role in educating parents and families about how, how they need to operate and they're managing their expectations, which will shift um, burden towards you know, childcare and other things as um, the challenges as everything goes back online, um, where many parents have been in, in, enabled to provide childcare in their home as they are as we do reopen in California and they are becoming expected to return to their work in person, um, it will be, there'll be challenges and burdens that we're all gonna bear together. So um, just again, framing that we've been successful. We have um, conservative strategies for preventing COVID-19 transmission, but we do need to expect, we are absolutely expecting to get phone calls from you guys on a daily basis on a possible exposure or, a known exposure and then providing guidance to navigate you through the next steps. Yeah, and thank you, Lisa. And I, you know, I, I see um, uh, public health nurse Marsha Grants, um, you know, on the with the, with us here today, and and just this this initial transmission in the pop up childcare between two siblings. Um, you know, we it was a Saturday, and we spent the day. Um, basically, uh, you know, um, inventing the role of public health liaison because, you know, it was the first, it was the first incident that we had to try to do all the right things and overdo all the right things and, and make sure that we are taking all the correct steps and communicating to all the potential potential exposures and that experience really kind of helped create the, the the role of the public health liaison mm -hmm. and so this is kind of a boiled down condensed version of what was presented uh, in our two public health liaison trainings you know these are the kind of the four main things that we really see your role as being is when something comes up to contact that public health uh, you know, uh, supporter in a, in a timely manner right away, you know, again, 24 seven phone numbers, phones and email. If there's a concern, bring it forward and get input from public health, a uh, knowledge of the protocols. And it seems like every time you use the protocols, you learn something a little bit different because there's always a little nuance to every scenario. There's questions that come up about, you know, um, just this, the specific details of that exposure or potential exposure and wanting, wanting to not miss a step in terms of doing, you know, communicating and, and supporting the, taking the right steps to support everyone's safety. Um, uh, one of the things that I know um, my colleague Melina has been you know, kind of created systems for is the ability to quickly access the information that we have to get to public health. There's a, there's a list of 20 questions or more that public health has. And, and um, in that, in that initial uh, learning of the incident, there are some critical questions that you can ask before it even gets to public health that can help support their their most efficient response. And so, um, you know, we're, we're we have a little checklist or there's actually a survey that the team has created at public health of think the kind of things that they're going to need to know. But the key is getting information on who was in the room, when were they in the room, what are their, con what are their contact names and numbers, um, both students and staff and potential visitors or substitutes. Um, and then, um, and then, of course, to initiate the appropriate school communications. It's not that you, the public health liaison, will be sending out the communication to the students and families and, and staff. It's that you will access the template communications, 
uh, fine tune it according to the specifics of that case and then you give it to your principal or uh, district staff who will provide the communication to all the appropriate um, all the appropriate uh, people and I do want to say that you know our our liaison training is available there's a link on this and um, there's two trainings that you, that, that you can access uh, videos of that have a much more detailed description of this role um, this is kind of the this is our little um, you know, Bible might be too strong a word, but this is really what we go to, to follow. Is this a scenario one? Is it a scenario two? Is it a scenario three? Is it a scenario four? What are the stat actions we should take? And then there's links um, to, to template letters and, and, and the letter can be revised and updated according to the specifics of yours. So as a public health liaison, what we want you to do is to, is to really get to know this document and to review it and understand it. You know, you know, last week in one of the classrooms, there was a scenario two. There was a student who had close contact with a family member who had tested positive. They were asymptomatic. We kept them out of class and, and got, they got tested. Over the weekend, we discovered that they were positive. So, you know, all appropriate steps um, have been taken. That cohort's closed. The student, um, you know, all of the other members of the cohort are being tested. Public health is guiding that cohort through the process to ensure we're doing everything we can to, to, uh, to contain it, tra tra track, trace, and contain uh, any transmission of the virus that may have occurred. This was another situation where it was brought into the school. It didn't happen at the school um, insofar as we know right now. But please, please study this, get to know it, look at the templates um, that will help you. Um, if you haven't already done so, make sure you're registered by the fact that you're on this phone call or this, uh, this, this Zoom workshop. It tells me that you've already registered. If there are members of your team who will serve in this role, please have them registered. That will give them the critical information, the phone numbers, and, and they'll be provided updates um, as we have them from public health in our community. And then the last thing I want to say before we get to the, the, um, the Q&A is that the importance of the school site specific protection plans cannot be understated. This is the bedrock of how each school um, intends to implement the 30 guidelines and um, public health is looking at these closely. Um, and what is very clear is that every school is different. You know, there are some, there are some district wide um, kind of umbrella protocols and procedures that make sense, but ultimately every school and the staff at every school and the parents at every school have to get engaged in the details of implementation of the plan at that site. And everybody needs to know how they're going to implement each of the 30 guidelines. And over time and with experience, there's going to be suggestions for how to do it better. And the, the plans can be updated and revised. But um, even though the states says if we keep where we are that we can start on August or September 29th um, uh, schools are uh, in Mar Marin County they need to, these plans need to be in place and reviewed by public health and the staff need to be comfortable with them and the parents need to understand them and everybody's engaged this is a total team effort to both develop implement question and fine-tune these plans for each site um, so, and I know we, I think right now we have maybe half of the, half of the schools in Marin County probably have submitted plans. And I, and Linda, I, you know, I just have to call out Linda and your whole team, Lisa, for, for the, the, the attention to detail and the thoroughness of their support in this process. I know it's a lot of reading and um, considering and, you know, they, uh, you know, they often come back with some suggestions. So do you want to say anything more about the plans, Lisa? Um, I, I want to second your gratitude to Linda Metz and our team. Um, they really are reading all of the documents um, and really trying to understand them. Um, you, when you review your school document, you shouldn't be seeing a boilerplate. What Mike said, every school is different, the entrance is different, and the way we're gonna be successful is um, as well as both parents, students, and staff know their facility and their school community in order to best um, understand the best practices um, to keep themselves um, safer. And so it really is, that's what we're expecting of each school and each principal at each school is that they um, have really 
had a collaborative approach to developing these plans. And because again, it builds confidence. It, it's a great, um, it's a great document for to be safe, safer. And we've seen the success in it. So again, reach out to your um, your leadership if if it's not in place yet. Um, it was it's past due. I already said the homework's past due. We, we went schools have been engaged in this for a while. Um, we'll accept late submissions, of course, because this is a partnership. And if any school is having any challenges, let us know. We want to work collaboratively with you because we want to set everyone up for success. Um, so I think that's it. The only other thing is we're also working on our own data systems. Um, we, we have great partners at MCOE um, and we'll be working um, with them again just to be able to we believe in um, being transparent in our data um, and sharing information about um, in a way that's um, vis visually um, friendly about which schools are open, which schools may have cohorts um, closed, which schools might be closed. There's specific guidance from the state around when there's a certain percentage of the student body affected um, by COVID-19 that public health will, will be closing those schools. And so we, we wanna be as transparent as possible in all of this data and we're working on our data system to make sure we can provide as timely information to the community and to the public a, as we can, because we know that this will also be, this data is important, important to keep our schools open and so people can see um, how the disease is progressing in our community and that and we can demonstrate accountability for our public health actions that we're taking um, the right measures to protect um, students, staff and the community at large, so. That's it for me. That's great. So, um, you know, Melina um, or Michelle, I, there, for some reason, I can't see if there's a if there's a, um, a comments or chat screen. Um, or, so we're going to open it up to questions and answers now. And um, okay, now I can see it. Um, so, um, you know, I guess we we have you know. Uh, a number, you know, about 57 people on, on this. And so I want to, I want to make this as much a dialogue as possible. So we can certainly use the chat, but also want to welcome people to unmute themselves and ask questions. Um, if it gets out of hand, we'll mute everyone and go back to the chat. But um, uh, does anyone have any questions based on what we just went over to start? You guys are easy. Come on, you, you you got some questions for us. While you're thinking of questions, Marsha or Linda, is there anything that you want to add? Um, I don't I'll see Sandra on the line. I would like to add something. Yeah, I've been reading a lot of these, and one of the things I've noticed that some of the schools have done is closed down their staff lunch room or lounge. Other schools have moved their lunch areas outside so that the teachers can go outside and have a space. And I just thought that as I was reading those, it just brought to mind that that could be a real, you start feeling really comfortable with your coworkers and you almost social isolate with them. And that could be a real danger area. So I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention that I thought that was a good move that people were doing it that way. Yeah, that's when we generally see yeah, the... Yeah, and what I'll say, you know, just... Yeah. Go ahead, Lisa. No, um, Linda's spot on. That where we see um, occupational uh, transmission of COVID-19, it's usually with your close work friends. It's when people are becoming less vigilant. And so, again, that's... We'll be striving our best throughout the year to keep reinforcing that. And then I'm um, encouraging you as public health liaisons, you know, to really engage leadership if you're... If you're seeing that behavior um, poorly role modeled, because our nature as humans is always to regress to our preferred behaviors. So not washing our hands enough, not wearing our face covering and um, being close to each other. That's our human nature. And it really, that is where we see, we have seen in other employment settings. It's when people are on break time, when people are doing things after hours and eating or drinking after hours in a small group, you don't know, um, it's, um, it's like an STD in many ways. You don't know who the COVID partners are of even your closest work friends or a gathering that they might've attended over the weekend. So um, the best way for you to do in your role is to role model that behavior, um, communicate to leadership if you're seeing that convening and socialization of staff 
or just gently reminding, um, see, see something, say something. That's what I've been encouraging staff to do um, and, and just role modeling that behavior because that's where they'll be in school transmission that we won't be able to control is when there's that socialization and that reduced vigilance. I, can I echo and add to that? You know, Mike was talking about the transmission that we had and the pop-ups really was an adult with children who was really just the transportation person who, you know, in a car. And we have seen it in our skilled nursing facilities as well. And I don't know, I have a sense of how many of our teachers work out of county, but people commute together. And I think, and I, and I don't know that we think so much about the fact that we're in a closed space sometimes with, if it's not nice outside, you know, got the windows rolled up and, and me and definitely under six feet for more than 15 minutes. So I'm just going to toss that out there. Yeah. And I, thank you, Marcia. And I, what I want to say is at our administrative office, what we did, we, we've normally had one staff room or staff lunch room. And so what we did is we just created another one. So we have two separate staff lunch rooms and we have a capacity sign at each one. It's very limited. It's like four. I think the majority of our staff right now, when the air quality and weather conditions are okay, are going outside to eat. There, there, there's a park behind our building, there's a courtyard here, and people are going for walks, and there's, you know, a couple parks in the area, um, but the, the, the lunchrooms, the, the north and south lunchroom now are used, but I would say lightly, but it, it is a really important um, consideration, I think, for staff. Um, there, there's also, so there's a question that came in, Lisa, about can you speak to face shields versus face masks versus humanity shields? So um, face coverings are what are required by law. Um, you sh everyone should be wearing a face covering. Um, we see some people that wear both a face mask and a face shield, and that is not what's recommended, but some people, especially those with higher risk, feel more comfortable wearing a face shield with a face covering and that's absolutely allowable. The state has made, um, we know some children, especially those with behavioral challenges or special needs have um, trouble wearing a face covering. And so that might be something that a face shield, if they are more comfortable wearing a face shield um, would be an option for a student. Um, and again, with the younger age students, it's, it's a learning process and educating them. Um, my kids, are finally, I'd say 90% there at good, they're in third and fifth grade um, at wearing their um, face coverings well, although there are times I arrive and the face cover is down. And again, that's our role for each other is just reminding each other um, to wear the face covering. The, a teacher though um, should not just wear a face shield alone. Um, the reason for that is because if you sneeze or you cough, the, sh the um, face the, it doesn't protect everyone. Um, that is why the alternative of the humanity shield has been off has been offered um, because it has the face shield. So, if people, especially um, children with special needs, or if there's um, speech therapy or occupational therapy where you really um, or access and functional needs where you do need to see the lips. What the humanity um, shield offers is that if someone were to sneeze, so you can see the face, but if you were to sneeze, there's basically a catchment that the Drop, if you ever seen that picture of when someone sneezes or coughs, the droplets are going everywhere. Um, that being said, most people shouldn't just be sneezing. Um, the loud achoos I don't think are acceptable anymore. I don't know why they were acceptable for so long. So um, people should be, um, we've talked about hand hygiene, but respiratory etiquette is really also critically important. Even if you're wearing a face cover, you wanna um, make sure that you're sneezing into the crook of your nose and also that you're adjusting. This is probably the biggest faux pas I see consistently is besides wearing the mask below the nose, which is the biggest faux pas. Um, the second one is that people are um, manipulating their mask from the front rather than from the ears. So if you just think about where your droplets are gathering as you're talking and speaking, you don't want to put your hand in the front of your mask. You want to be adjusting it from the side of your ears. Um, because again, going back to that, let's say you put your hands in front of your mask and you wash your hands right away and you washed it for the 20 seconds like we instruct you to, that would reduce your risk significantly. Reality is most people after they're adjusting their mask are not then going and washing their hands in the true 20 second, um, way that we have um, instructed people to do. Um, so that's where you'll then, um, for yourself, if let's say you were carrying a virus, any virus, honestly, 
Um, you're going to touch something. It's going to be in your hands. You're going to touch the table. Um, you shouldn't be shaking anyone's hands anymore. That's those days are past uh, for a while. Um, and so that those are the ways that we are, are protecting each other. So I think, sorry, that was a longer answer than I thought. But <laughs> so Lisa, there's a, there's a question that came up regarding the isolation protocols. What about the person who supervises a student while waiting for the parents to pick up and that student test positive? So this would be a symptomatic students. We're isolating them. Parents are come picking them up. There is a staff member who's supervising them. You know, what, what can they do to protect it's themselves? I mean, the same thing, so wash your hands before you're with the student, make sure you have your protective, um, your face covering on. If um, you feel more comfortable putting a face shield on, um, I, I believe most schools should have that available. Maintaining the six feet distance, um, and then um, unless the child is very ill, um, trying to maintain the six feet distance and then just checking in on the student. We do appreciate, and again, um, I know there's a bunch of nurses on the phone, like sometimes a child is really sick, They the parent did everything right. There's no known exposure. The child gets sick and needs to be attended to. And that's okay. And you can protect yourself. That's where going back to our own personal protective behaviors is, you know, washing, washing your hands, uh, make sure you're wearing a face covering and all those things. Well, it should continue to protect you as you're waiting for the arrival of the parents. And I, I've, um, my son's now been, my family's one of the most tested families, I think. Um, they've, they present, and this is the thing just to remind everyone, um, most of the times you're going to have a kid with symptoms like COVID-19, it's not going to be COVID-19. Um, our testing rate right now is two to 3% um, positivity. Um, those are higher risk individuals that are getting tested, people that are symptomatic. Um, most times it's going to be another virus. We're hoping to see less virus circulating because of all the good behaviors we're aspiring to, but um, most times it's not going to be COVID-19. That's probably our most common scenario. Um, possible exposure, someone gets tested, not COVID-19, and to be prepared for that. There's a question that came up about uh, parents asking about transmission through eye, the eyes and, are, and, are, and therefore pushing face shields in addition to masks. Would you please talk a little bit about the likelihood of transmission through eyes? It's possible. It's not the most um, likely transmission, but again, that's where if you touch virus and it's on your hands and then you rub your eyes, you could introduce um, the virus um, through that mucous membranes. Um, that virus is like mucous membranes. It's not the most common transmission, um, but it, it, it's it's possible. Um, we do when you you'll see when someone um, gets uh, tested for um, COVID nineteen, the nurse or medical assistant who's testing them will wear the eye shield and wear eye protection. Um, but it's not the most um, most common or my most likely route of of infection is the through the eyes possible so, so the, and there was a question that came in about um this the, someone who jumped on late the school's hotline number and um an email and so this is something this, this training is going to be posted publicly um on our website so we're not saying it or posting the the school liaison hotline number um, or email. I guess we showed the email, so now that's out of the bag. But um, all all of the registered public health liaisons will be emailed if you haven't already. The the weekday and the weekend numbers and email addresses to get the most direct support. So we we purposefully aren't putting on on the slides or saying it here. Um, there's a. Uh, should we should we be tracking attendance of volunteers who come in to help distribute lunches and have some contact with students? Marcia, you want to field that? Yes, you should be absolutely. I so, but to clarify for me, are we allowing volunteers on site? Because I was under the impression we were not. Yeah. So so thank you. The the you know. All non-essential visitors should, you know, you should, you should not have uh, non-essential visitors. And so that includes parent volunteers. And, um, you know, there's a specific guideline that speaks to this. And the only, the only exception is essential workers. This would be like someone coming in to service the HVAC system or copy machines. Um, and they, they definitely need to sign in and document their presence so that if either, 
um, if there was an exposure potential from them or with them, we'd have a way of contacting them. So, but yeah, I would say that uh, parent volunteers are not something that fit within the health and safety protocols that we're, we're now engaging in, uh, that we're now so, recommending. Mike, just to clarify, I've read a lot of these and there are multiple schools that have to, um, they call it grab and go lunches. And even if they're doing hybrid, I guess on Mondays, there's people that come to the school and actually distribute the lunches for the week and the breakfasts for the week. And um, the afternoon session usually is found a place somewhere on campus to eat that grab and go lunch. But I would think that maybe that question is for the people that are actually handing out those lunches. And if they're working for an organization, I would think they would be an essential worker and need to be tested. Yeah, so, and, and we have a, you know, it's, it's probably a, a much lower volume, but we, we're delivering, we have a staff member at MCOE who's delivering lunches to our special education campuses and classrooms throughout the county and alternative education. And so the instruction for that individual is to, you know, is to not have any contact, basically knock on the door, put the boxes of lunches for that cohort outside the door and not have contact or very minimal contact, maybe with the teacher, but with proper distancing and face covering. So, so, you know, it's something that that's a, that's a protocol. That's a, that's, that should be part of your um, school site specific protection plan, how you're going to, how you're going to distribute uh, grab and go lunches, um, minimizing contact. I would say. Um, okay, so, okay, outside um, many multifamily households with access to health insurance or vehicles, what extra safety measures can be taken by a site that knows a large part of its population is unable to isolate because they live with eight or more others who, um, who cannot work remotely? That's the bread and butter of our work in our outbreak responses, working with these families who cannot, um, don't have the, the privilege that many of us have to have separate bathrooms and separate bedrooms. So our contact tracing team, um, when they um, identify anyone who um, tests positive is um, learning about the home environments, providing additional guidance for these families on how to more safely quarantine and isolate when, um, when there is a known positive in um, the crowded housing situation. So that's our first strategy. Our second strategy, again, is when um, people, when our, when our investigators are communicating with, um, with these households, and again, they can be mixed households with different families, um, encouraging individuals to get tested at the right time, and then why we are doing targeted, offering targeted testing in some of the higher prevalence um, COVID-19 communities. And we'll be working to expand, expand the work that we've had in the canal um, to other parts of uh, the county where there's similar, it's um, low income, low wages is not just a, a San Rafael Canal area issue, it's across Marin County. So we'll be shifting from, I think I mentioned earlier, from outbreak response to outbreak prevention in some of these communities, but it will be challenging and um, we'll be following the natural course of, of this disease. And again, just working um, with partners like Marin Community Clinics, they've been on board with us since the beginning, um, making sure that Let's say, for example, when an exposure notice goes out and there might be limited English proficiency um, and um, that they'll have a partner with Marine Community Clinics or any of our other federally qualified health centers to support families through the testing process and through the isolation and quarantine process um, if necessary. So we're, again, this is a community-wide approach. The schools aren't standing alone. Our healthcare partners are, are side by side with us. Um, we've had calls all week with Marin Health, Partnership Health Plan, Kaiser, MCC, all preparing um, the healthcare side of this world um, to provide supports to families, um, staff as well, um, to ensure staff have access to testing, um, and um, students, of course. So um, it's, ch it's challenging, it's not easy, um, but we've seen success. Fortunately, COVID isn't like measles. Measles has a really high household transmission rate, above 85%. Um, new studies are showing depending on the household, it's like the 10 to 20% range. So it's not as um, contagious as measles is, but it is contagious in the more crowded your living situation the, um, and the more challenges that you have access to cleaning materials, it might, it, it would be more um, contagious. But um, we have a bilingual, we're partnering with not just 
this isn't just again a public health issue. We have community partners, including North Marine Community Services, um, Canal Alliance, um, and other community partners who have bilingual, bicultural staff who also are supporting us um, in um, supporting families. And then also providing access to families who have lost wages and qualified due to their income to disaster relief payments to ensure they keep stay housed. And they, again, so we've built structures in place to support our most vulnerable families, but it still remains a risk and why one of our first, besides isolation quarantine, um, the first tool that making accessible is testing. And that's something we continue to lean in and we've been successful because of our efforts at testing. Thank you, Lisa. So th this is a, an important question that came up at a meeting uh, that I was at this morning. Um, uh, one of the participants saying some of the instructional assistants are having trouble getting tested before school starts. Is there a magic word to tell doctors to help them get their baseline and then their once every two months testing and I what I here's what I what I learned in the meeting this morning is that we had some people in that meeting as as uh, staff who work regularly with kids who went through Kaiser and basically were turned away and then other staff who said hey I'm an essential worker I work with kids I need to get tested before I get to school you know, before we start school and got a test within 24, you know, we're scheduled within 24 hours and got their test results back through Kaiser within 12 hours. And so what, what we know that there's been a directive from public health to, to our uh, healthcare providers and that um, there's communication that we've given to our staff that, that your healthcare provider must, as an essential worker, must provide you with tests. Um, but that hasn't gotten through to every person at Kaiser who picks up the phone, who answers the email. So what are the, what are the magic words, Lisa, that can get us, you know, get us in there? I have two magic words. I have more, more words. You know I use more <laughs> words. Um, first is to email your provider. Um, we're learning at Kaiser the direct, if you're a Kaiser member, emailing your provider is the fastest way to get tested. Use the word, to, use the words, I'm an essential worker at a school, the health officer is requiring testing. If you're not having success, LHI is the next three magic letters. We have daily openings at our LHI testing site in San Rafael at the West America Bank. And you could get tested, maybe, you could probably get tested today if you wanted to get tested today, because they were open until seven o'clock at night and we've seen a drop off in testing at that site. It was our, one of our earliest sites and it was targeted at the canal and we did a lot of outreach to make um, ensure access to canal residents. Um, but it's very conveniently located off of the 101. Um, so LHI is the three magic letters if the email to your Kaiser doctor doesn't get you there. And then to continue to report it to us because we are, this is, a, this is by law, um, they need to do this. And it's, um, it's a hard pill for, for some to follow, depending on the organization, but um, fortunately, we're, we've had good cooperation from of our healthcare partners. Um, doctors sometimes have thick brains, and so the doctors on the front lines might not have been listening to the directives of the uh, uh, that have come down from the administration itself. So there, that's probably why you're seeing some local variation. Uh, also, if you live outside of Marin County. Um, our influence is really directly connected to the administration of our healthcare systems within Marin County. So you may, um, there's larger Kaiser systems and larger healthcare systems that you might be tapping into that don't have the same forceful community, say forceful, that's a bad word, um, strong communication from the health officer around testing. So um, let us know, we'll, we'll reach out to our other health officers and other counties to make sure, um, Again, we're all interconnected in the Bay Area, making sure that our teachers and school staff in Marin County have access to what is their, um, by their right of having health insurance and being an essential worker during these times. So here's, yeah, here's a lot a, more words than one magic word. Thank you. That, but what, so uh, Lisa, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to, you know, uh, boil that down into a statement that we can send out to the school community. Here, here's the updated recommendations from public health. If you're having difficulty uh, scheduling a test, here are some steps you can take to expedite your testing. Because um, we know there's going to be like a, a big kind of wave of need for testing as schools begin to gear right. up. Um, so we'll do our best to support it. Um, so this is an interesting question. Some staff members have been bringing their children to work because they cannot find childcare. Are children of school employees allowed or would they be non-essential visitors? I would say they would be non-essential visitors. 
I don't know if there's different district policy um, that I, I, that would be the answer I have. So I would almost defer yeah. back to the district. Yeah, and I, and I would, I would say that, um, you know, this would be something that would be, need to be very clearly defined in your school site specific protection plan. I know that there are some schools and districts who have um, worked on plans to support parents uh, who have kids, their staff who have kids to provide a you know, a, um, a properly structured childcare offering at their site that's, that's cohorted and all the practices are in place and it's arranged in advance. But I feel like this is something that is very specific to your site and your district and needs to be very clearly defined. It can't just be, oh, my kid can go to school today. I, I'm bringing them to work. That would be non-essential. So it needs to be spelled out. And I think this is going to be one of our ongoing challenges. We saw this with you know, power outages and wildfires and smokes is that um, our school staff live across the Bay Area and each school district is going to be opening at um, different times. Um, and so child, the child care issues that as some essential workers are dealing with now will be child care issues for school staff in the future. So um, really working with administration, I mean, that's Part, that's a part of all of this is how to make sure that individuals who are working and who are essential and school staff absolutely are essential workers um, should have access to, to child care. But uh, I know that that's um, when all schools are not in session. And like we saw that when um, the power outage is shut down Sonoma County, it affects Marin County because um, people don't have access to um, child care because the schools are closed. We're, we have such interconnection. So really um, planning for yourself, um, it's all relevant to me today because the air quality is worsening and it's getting hotter and we're getting early notice of power outages. So um, just as much as you're preparing now today for COVID-19, also making sure that you're working with your family to have your other disaster plans and childcare plans ready and encouraging your school to support all staff and making sure that's part of this planning. So um, we, ha we have a few more minutes left and, and um, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to get as many of the questions as we can. There may be a few that we'll hold till next time. But here's a question about, we have students who, who ride the bus to school. How are positive cases on buses handled? They would be treated as a cohort. Um, so the bus would be considered a cohort itself. Um, most bus rides, um, are over 15 minutes. So we're gonna be very conservative in that approach. And then we'll have to, that's where our, we have amazing, it's called investigation. So basically we're gonna track down um, when, when what's the, we identify a date of an infectious period once we confirm a case and determine when they were infect, infectious and then try and track how they were moving in their cohorts um, prior to us detecting that they were a positive case. And so a, a bus positive most likely will result in um, in some children, the majority of children on that bus being quarantined um, and potentially um, some children on that bus and cohorts being closed because of a bus exposure. Cause that's every time we're, that's a mixing opportunity, right? There's stable cohorting, which is our classroom, but then buses represent a time. And also aftercare is another important example. So um, aftercare and buses, so the before and after school, um, transportation in and aftercare after, also represent this mixing time when it's not that same stable cohort. And the other mixing opportunity is the sibling mixing, um, where we're again identifying kids might, um, there might have been exposure of a middle school um, and then um, the, the child at the elementary school in the same household should be um, quarantined. So there's these mixing opportunities that um, why we have amazing nurses and public health investigators who are gonna be working with you. That's not your role. Um, your role is not to, um, be deducing all of these. It's to provide us with the information and those lists so then we can um, make the best decisions around what cohorts need to be closed and who else needs to be notified. So for example, in San Rafael, it's not the school district that's operating child aftercare, it's the city. And so really trying to identify where those other um, exposures may be. And then, um, and also as we're going online, our team is also working on the case identification, identify well, did they go to, uh, um, MMA class. And so now we need to notify the MMA class because um, it kind of spreads. So that's that's our role. Your role is just having strong attendance lists, what we call line lists. Um, so we know who's in that cohort. Um, we'll work um, with the school district to make sure in those busing situations and with the aftercare providers like YMCA um, and 
Nevada and other um, child care providers that we have the list there and then we can do the investigation and provide the guidance on which cohorts to close. Um, sometimes we, we err on the side of caution and we'll close as, as you can imagine, um, we use the word in um, our clinical word is there, there's poor, there's good historians and there's poor historians. Um, and so we really are dependent on the information that we receive from, um, from the person who is uh, tested positive for COVID-19 to understanding that their, their movement through our community. And, um, and there's variations on how well they provide that information. So we do our best. Um, we see ourselves as investigators and trying to get to the root of it so we can, again, identify which cohorts need to be closed. And just to reassure you, these cohort closures is us erring on, on the side of caution to, to the best way we can again, even though most of those individuals wouldn't actually meet the definition of close contact, um, we're gonna treat it that way um, as we are in this phase of this disease. So there's a couple, there's a couple other questions about testing and, and you know, there's one uh, participant who wants to repeat the law around staff testing and is there any way that the county could help provide testing for teachers on campuses? We're looking, we're exploring that. I wouldn't be for all campuses. It would be looking um, from an equity lens and um, in an outbreak um, settings. Um, so where we would see ourselves deploying is if there are multiple cohorts potentially closed or an outbreak setting, that's where public health resources would come into play um, potentially to offering on-site testing. So we're building our capacity to have that mobile testing capability, but it won't be part of our standard practice at this time. So there's a, and there's a couple questions about nurses, you know, um, uh, you know, there's, there, there, we know that there's just not enough school nurses to go around. We'd love to have it. Can we, Lisa, can we have a nurse at each campus? I mean, I think that's what people are asking us. You know, we know that that's not the case. And I, and, and I don't know, how, you know, if we have a response to that, that can be helpful. Um. Not that could be helpful. I think it absolutely would be helpful to have it. I grew up in the in the 70s and 80s where I did have a school nurse on each school site, and I think there's tremendous value in that. Unfortunately, budgets have not allowed that. Can we do this together without a nurse at each campus? Yes, we can. Um, is it better when there is a nurse at each campus? Yes, it is. And again, we will try and do our best to um, synergize all the capabilities we have. I there. I need more nurses personally in my life, honestly. Um, they've been, nurses have been the um, stars of our response to COVID. And um, we've seen in other districts that sometimes it takes, takes an emergency or a disaster for people to value what, um, what they need to value in um, nursing support and health ed from not just for pandemic response, but for the behavioral and emotional supports of children, I think is critical. Um, yeah, and it, you know what I'll add is I feel like you know Lisa, your team, Linda and Marsha and Danielle, you know, and you know Sandra, and is it you know you've got it? I feel like we've got a whole new fleet of school nurses who are here to support us, and I and so I feel like to the whole school community, I just want to say, hey, in addition to our normal district and, and school nurses, which are too short in supply, mm -hmm. we also have this public health team who's at, who's at our our, our beck and call. And I really feel that um, when the most, you know, serious question. So there's one more question that's come up a couple of times about, is it possible to take mask breaks for kids? How, you know, um, you know, well, kids, are, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. Kids are allowed to, it's not preferred in this. So kids are allowed outside with their cohort um, without their mask and playing outside without their mask. It's allowable. Um, and I think it's helpful. The risk of transmission and especially that elementary school population from kid to kid and from kid to adult is, is significantly lower and being outdoors um, protects you against that. Um, is it safer if kids are outside with their mask on? Yes, it's safer, but sometimes, um, I, I'll go to Lenora Kwok, one of, uh, an amazing nurse, there's ideal and then there's real. Um, so the outdoor mask is, without a mask with your cohort on a playground where you're, again, this is where that school site safety plan, we're gonna sound like broken records, is so critical because the school is looking at the classes and how they can um, stagger classes and stagger use of different space. Kids do need to get outside and exercise. I mean, that's part of, of having a healthy school day is being outside and, and exercising. So um, there can be breaks, if, um, but not indoors. Um, it should be in an outdoor space that's supervised and that again, Kids are going to play on the playground, and are they going to stay six feet apart? No, we don't. 
and that's they need to be instructed, encouraged, and reminded. Um, but we want to again try and um, straddle what is ideal and what is real as we come you know, come back online. So it's a the breaks are allowable um, outside okay. in a controlled so, setting. Yes, and so you know, so you guys, it's four o'clock, and I know that there's more questions that we haven't got to. The the vision here is that every Thursday at three o'clock for the next few weeks, we're going to regather this group to continue to have a dialogue and discussion, and we'll gain some experience through as we gradually reopen site-based classroom instruction. And the vision is we'll get to a point where we'll have a tabletop exercise. Maybe we'll do district breakout groups to have different scenarios, the different people in this group can can address and come up with what they would do. I know I see Janelle Campbell, my colleague here, our director of special education, who um, ha, is kind of writing the book on checklists about communications. And I want to tap that wisdom maybe at our next meeting. But most importantly, I want to thank Lisa, you and your team for your support and partnership through this. And thank all of you for stepping up into this critical role. And we look forward to seeing you next week at the about the same time. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Thank everyone. You.